Welcome to episode 157 of The Startup Show. Today I'm here at the office of Markus Gross, who is an ETH professor. He's the head of Disney Research, but he's also a startup investor and a startup founder. So all of the heads in one person. And we are talking about, obviously, the ETH and Disney. We also talk about the different startups he's involved, but most importantly, what you should be looking for when you're a student and what you should aim for in the long term. Make sure to stay tuned for the whole video. Welcome to episode 157 of The Startup Show. Today we are here talking to Markus Gross, who is a very, very interesting person with many different hats. And I'm really excited to talk to him. But as usual on The Startup Show, the first few minutes is really dedicated to the person who I'm hosting today. Markus, it's such a pleasure to have you here on the show. Um, maybe give my audience for the two people out there who don't really know you yet, who you are. Thank you very much, uh, Cedric. It's a great pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm Markus. I'm in my 50s. It's the best years of my life. <laughs> yes. I've been in Switzerland for the last 25 years, pretty much. I came here in my early 30s. Uh, together with my family, my kids are growing up, my daughter turns 30, my son 28, and uh, we are living downtown, we are enjoying the country, we are Swiss citizens, and as such, uh, in my profession, you know, I'm uh, divided up between ETH Zurich and the Walt Disney Company. What is very inspiring about you, you wear so many different hats. You are a professor at the, one of the leading universities, you're also an investor, you also have startups, and you also work in the professional, like, uh, corporate world. And that is something that I really want to, to touch base a little bit because like I don't think there are many people who can you can pick your brain like in that sense. Let's start off by one of your uh, highlights um, with the Tech Oscar in 2013 and also like the Golden Globes and uh, maybe you can elaborate just to give a little bit of context what you guys do here at Disney Research and um, what, what that meant to you to win this. Yes uh, this was of course a major event uh, in my life to receive an award and a recognition from the Academy mm -hmm. and as you know the Academy has the arts track and it has a technology track so we got a the so-called Achievement Award of the Academy. It's often called the Tech Oscar. As a researcher, I've always been uh, focusing on the development of special effects, uh, computer simulations, computer graphics, computer animation. And some of these technologies have been heavily used by the special effects industry in Hollywood. And they quickly migrated into a lot of uh, big shot Hollywood movies. And this is what uh, led the Academy to give us the recognition because recognition is essentially for technological innovation which has a sustainable and significant impact on film production or post-production. And this is what we are also doing both at ETH and in collaboration here with the Walt Disney Company. So we are developing technological innovations to drive the forefront of film production, post-production and special effects. And in that we collaborating with the largest film conglomerate in the world, the Walt Disney Company. As you know, we have five film studios. It's the Marvel Studios, the Live Action Studios, it's Pixar, it's Feature Animation, and it's Lucasfilm. And our technologies, the technologies we develop here in Zurich, they are almost in each and every Disney film production in one way or the other. Mm -hmm. And this makes us very proud, of course. Sure. I mean, when you, when you look back on all of these projects, I mean, Walt Disney is so big these days and you have so many uh, videos that came out of there. Maybe can you elaborate on like what were like the most of the exciting projects that you've done in the past, uh, just to get a sense of like what you're actually working on? Yes. Uh, one of the, when we started with the Walt Disney Company, it's about 10 years ago, I set a goal for the team and the goal was to mm -hmm. overcome the so-called uncanny valley in special effects. This is the, the strange alienation effect you get when you look at the face which is synthetic, mm -hmm. a special effect face of a human. It looks almost human but not quite human. And this is something the industry has been struggling with for a long time. And within this decade, I'm very proud to say that we have managed to overcome this uncanny valley by a whole new generation of technologies. It's called the Medusa Facial Motion Capture System. And I'm also very proud that just a week ago, we got a letter from the Academy that once again, we won a tech Oscar yeah. for our work on special effects uh, in faces. Mm -hmm. So this is a project that clearly makes me most proud of and anecdotically for me the highlight as a Star Wars fan, somebody who really <laughs> grew up with Star Wars 
uh, the greatest thing for me was to join the film set of episode seven and to see J.J. Abrams directing this movie. This was absolutely awesome. Mm -hmm. I will never forget in my life. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. About 10 years ago, when you actually brought Disney research to Zurich, uh, I heard that was also uh, not simple. Uh, how did you, were you able to convince Uh, the management of bringing, you know, Disney to Zurich. Uh, there was this push towards technology and to establish research laboratories close to top uh, notch universities. There was this understanding, first of all, that what we have been doing in research at ETH in special effects, in mm -hmm. computer animation, was of highest value to the company. Uh, the company also quickly realized that Zurich, the greater Zurich area, has this excellent infrastructure, mm -hmm. uh, the cosmopolitan and setting the quality of life so that it's easy to attract talent and talent is global, you know, we draw from all over the world and it's fairly easy to draw talent into Zurich, much like Google and others have also. And I think we found a very good compromise, a good solution, which is a win-win situation uh, for everybody. So there's an extensive collaboration contract. It ensures that we can very easily, through ETH, mm -hmm. connect with anybody uh, at Disney Research and start new projects. So this has worked out quite nicely. Also, um, since we are having a fairly academic setting here, so we have PhD students at Disney Research, we have uh, master students at Disney Research, and this is my prim primary role. So I, I'm acting as a supervisor to, the, to those students, to those projects, and I'm directing essentially the research agenda of the lab. And like now, when you look at um, all of like what what the benefits are, let's say of, of ETH, um, what would you say is it that like makes it so unique to to work here or like study here at the research center of Disney in Switzerland? Like you mentioned before, the five locations and everybody has a little bit their strength. Was it, what is it here, here in Zurich? If you build a corporate research lab, no matter what corporation you are, uh, of course there's a natural desire to have the lab on your main campus. Mm -hmm. But Los Angeles is a superb place for artists and creatives. Mm -hmm. But maybe it's not the most desirable place in the world for top scientists. I mean, some it is, there's Caltech and we are in the process of establishing collaboration with Caltech. But as a matter of fact, it was much more difficult to convince top researchers to join sort of a lab which is situated in the heart of Hollywood rather than a lab that is located next to one of the greatest technical universities of the world where you have the intellectual infrastructure mm -hmm. researchers one. They can go to seminars, they can work with students, they can work with PhDs, with postdocs, they can connect to professors. And I think this setting is truly unique. The degree of permeability we achieved between the Walt Disney Company, this lab here, which is a corporate lab, and the school ETH, thanks also to the flexibility of ETH and even the flexibility of the Walt Disney Company, this is really worldwide unique, we feel, and it's a great role model for any sort of public-private uh, partnership mm. uh, in research. I mean, I would like to switch hats now from academic uh, corporate to investor slash startups, um, yes, yeah. which is also like a very big part of your, of your time, that where you spend your time on. You founded many companies, one of them Propulsion Academy, Laura Mayo, who was a guest once here on the startup show also. Uh, but you invested in over 10 startups. One is, the latest one is Arbrea Labs, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, what, what is it there that you do exactly with the startups? Honestly, in terms of how I split my time, of course, a lot, maybe 90% goes into ETH and Disney, mm -hmm. and my activity as a business angel and co-founder is sort of a hobby, an extended hobby of <laughs> yes. mine. I co-founded my first uh, ETH spin-off company about 20 years ago with a company called Cyfax. It's still alive. Uh, it's medical dental technologies, mm -hmm. and uh, they are in early con. Um, I'm, I'm not a member of this company anymore, but I was a co-founder. And so I was always quite entrepreneurial, and I like this idea of creating a new entrepreneurial structure because, you know, it's a multi-parameter problem, a startup company, there are lots of things you can do wrong and there's only possibly one way that works. So you always have to make sure that you do the right things. I also love, of course, since I'm primarily a scientist and a researcher, mm -hmm. I like to see my inventions to go into products. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no more satisfaction, not so much the money and the financials, that's also nice. Seeing novel technology eventually ending up in a product 
that is accepted by and loved by the market. That's mm -hmm. fantastic. Yes, I can imagine. What are your bets on right now? What are the different startups? Uh, I mean, Propulsion, which is yes, in education? I'm, yes, absolutely. Propulsion Academy, that's more like, a, it's primarily a passion of mine. I feel extremely passionate about the idea that you immerse, you know, we tap into this intellectual potential we have here. For instance, I myself, I've been teaching introduction to programming for many, many years at ETH. Mm -hmm. So I know how it is to get students into programming. But we have so many people, you know, out here that totally have the intellectual potential to become great programmers, but they don't need to go through five years ETH computer science degree to do so. Mm -hmm. So this idea to immerse students for three months period from day to night, you know, in a very practical fashion, hands-on, because programming is actually a craft, and a craft you have to learn by doing. To do this and then condition them for the market, because we have this increasing gap in demand for tech talent and what the universities and the Fachhochschule can deliver. Uh, so that's fantastic. This is clearly one of my bets I'm, I'm very passionate about, and I feel that the company like Propulsion Academy is absolutely, absolutely needed for the Swiss economy. And I'm very happy that Laurent, you know, the dean, developed so much passion himself yes, and is. dedication to, to run this place against all odds. It's not so easy to find acceptance, also in a country like ours, where we believe very much in well-established educational mm -hmm. tracks, so you have to do a lot of groundwork. So the other one I'm involved in is uh, Apria Labs, as you mentioned. So this is a company which develops a technology stack based on machine learning for the rapid creation of humanoid avatars on mobile devices. So it's basically about body scanning and creation of three-dimensional models of the human bodies mm -hmm. that are animatable uh, with the application of plastic surgery and press surgery. So that's a deep technology company. I, I really like that, and I've worked myself a lot on those technologies. Mm -hmm. Another one I'm involved in is NanoCorp. So that's a more aggressive model, which we want to basically democratize the way you do cross-platform marketing uh, on social media. So online marketing, say putting an ad on Facebook and on Google, which is intrinsically difficult for many small and small-sized businesses, say like a coffer or right. piano teachers. So you want to make this available. And this is a cool concept. It heavily leverages uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence. And um, so I'm, I'm also very excited about that one. In general, uh, I would say that uh, given my background, I'm mostly interested in companies at the moment that leverage machine learning in some way and either graphics or vision. So it has to be sort of pixels and computers and intelligence. Yes. This is what I love. What stage do you usually get involved? I'm mostly involved very early stage because oftentimes it's a bit opportunistic. So I typically involve myself as a co-founder or very early investor and business angel because what I learned over time is one thing is the idea and the yes. technology, but what's far more important is the team and the composition of a team. And whenever I spot students of mine, PhD students, master students, who I feel they have the entrepreneurial spark, I try to convince them to sit down and think about something exciting they could do. And the idea sometimes comes second. It's not so, in the early days it was often time, well, we have this great PhD thesis, maybe they did some case correction as a part of mm -hmm. it, and let's make a company out of it, and let's see who wants it. Yeah. And this also works. But I think the far better concept is to say, hey, let's get the team together. Let's see if we find the right people that fit to each other, that have the salesmanship, the showmanship you need, but still the technical depth. And let's bring them together and say, hey, what do you feel excited about? What does the market need? You know, what's hot? And what can we do? Where is our differentiator? Where is our expertise? And then, so to speak, craft the product. Because there's nothing worse than having a product the market doesn't need. And oftentimes, we as technologists, I've seen this a lot with ETH students, we are so much in love with our technology, you know, and feel the market must need that. But in oh, the man, end, you no know, it's as though but nobody, nobody, really nobody wants, wants it. it. Yes, <laughs> it happens. Um, <laughs> it happens a lot. Now, you look a lot at the ETH spin-off companies. Um, what makes them so unique? So I've been 
looking at this business for over 20 years and it has changed dramatically, I have to mm -hmm. say. 20 years ago, there was almost nothing. And then thanks to ETH, technology transfer, Greater Zurich area, all the support structures we have here, we have a fairly vibrant high-tech uh, startup scene. What I think is the ETH spin-off, first of all, they compel by their technology and by their technical competence because, you know, our students have a very high level of technical sophistication and technical knowledge and capabilities. And oftentimes, the spin-off companies, I call them nugget companies. They have this little nugget of technology nobody else has. You know, it's protected by intellectual property. It's a small team all great specialists. This is also why, at least in IT, I mean, it's different in pharma and bio, but in IT, those companies are purchased fairly early. Mm -hmm. So typically these companies go through seed round and then it becomes very quickly, very attractive for large high-tech companies to snatch those. And for the founders, it's also sufficiently attractive. Maybe it's more attractive like than going through a risky series A and you don't know and you have to go international, you have to build sales organization and mm -hmm. so forth and so on. So it's better to go, go for the equi-hire route. And that has happened a huge lot. And this is mainly the reason why uh, some of the big ones are here. For instance, NVIDIA is here. It was a startup company I was involved in called Novadex was purchased by another company. And ultimately, it's now the NVIDIA physics engine. So we have a lot of those examples. But I would wish that in the startup scene that we would move into a scene in which we have more larger companies, you know, that go through multiple series of investments now happening occasionally, not necessarily in the most high tech places, but in some platform companies are fairly big uh, these days. But I think we have to instill into our entrepreneurs that the seed round is not your last round and your goal should not be primarily to be bought by the big fruit company yes. or somebody else or by Google, but you should really go for multiple series and you should make the thing big and then you can still think about selling. You basically answered already the question that I wanted to ask you about the difference because you're so often in the US, I think you spend about half time here, half time there. Yes. Maybe you can elaborate just one more point about like where you see the main differences are, let's say, to the US startup ecosystem. I would say the entrepreneurial hunger and aggressiveness is still less here than it is at Silicon Valley or you know, in Tel Aviv or yes. at places that's really different. And it's partly also because of our different value system and the different context we are having. I think many times, at least from the high tech scene where the CEOs have typically a technical background, there is a little bit of reservation mm -hmm. to be to become sufficiently aggressive to drive the company forward and as said, in the end, it is very, very tempting, especially in the current climate, to sell early. Mm -hmm. And this is typically not the mindset of uh, the U.S. startups. You know, whenever you talk to U.S. entrepreneur, they all want to change the world. They all want to go IPO. You know, they have a different yes. goal. And this is what they pursue. And in the end, if they get an attractive offer for purges, they still do it. But maybe at a later stage and a different Level. And it's partly also our value system here in Switzerland, I think, but uh, instilling a little bit more of that hunger, and I call it aggressiveness, it sounds negative, but it's yes. actually meant in a very positive way, way, right? Uh, that would really be good for our startup scene. Um, but it has improved a lot. As mm -hmm. I said, it's so different and I'm very proud of it. You have a lot of students and, and I'm sure they need some kind of like inspiration that you tell them in your classes, especially when you teach CS. What is it that like um, you tell them? in your classes? <laughs> Usually what I do, I start my class with a little movie clip. You yeah. know, I show them a scene from Star Wars, maybe. From Disney, know, obviously. Yeah, from Dis <laughs> yeah, mostly from Disney. Yeah, so there's no choice or a scene from Frozen, a Disney movie. Yes. And then explain them, said, look, and now let me explain you a little bit about technology underneath and what we have done. And this is very compelling to them. If they mm -hmm. see, wow, here there is, first of all, there's a lot of mathematical sophistication underneath, you know, it's deep technology. And even better, this has been done in Zurich. So my favorite one is to show the snow in Frozen and then say, look, this snow is not American snow, but first of all, it's 
synthetic snow, it's yeah. digital snow, yeah. but it doesn't look like American snow, it's real Swiss snow because we did all the measurements and all the mathematical modeling for that snow uh, here with us. And, and this is typically what pulls it's the students. Uh, what are some of the tips for balancing work and life? Pick one day a week, which I do very religiously. It could be Saturday, it can be any day a week, and don't work. Don't work. Sleep 24 hours, including sleep, don't work. That's it. <laughs> Good. What traits do you look for when you hire? I hire mostly technical talent, so I look for technical competence, but I look for personality. When you interview a lot of people, you develop a sense for personality traits. And this is, I feel, the most important. What's important to you as an investor? For me, it's mostly because I go early, it's the team. The composition of the team must be right, the personalities within the team must be right, and those who pay attention to detail and those who are the showmen, this mix must be right. Now, when you look at, at the entrepreneur by itself, what do you think is the most important character of an entrepreneur? For me, it's really somebody who is hungry. You have to have a goal, and the best goal you can have, it sounds a little stupid, but you have to want to be rich, mm -hmm. and then you have the right <laughs> attitude. And for someone who is as busy as you, what is your biggest uh, productivity hack? I always have to have inspiration, and you can draw inspiration from many different things. It can be a cool Netflix show, it just can be a little bit of motorcycling or piano playing, but I have to keep my inspiration going, and there are different means to do that. The advice I would give is definitely follow things you feel most passionate about. This is what I tell my students when they typically come and when look for a master thesis and said, ah, oh, now machine learning is such a hot topic, but I would so much rather like to solve differential equations. And they tell them, solve the differential equations, do what you feel most passionate about. Don't look for short-term trends. If you want to be successful, you have to love what you do. I've seen this so many times. It has been a reoccurring pattern. Don't look primarily for money. Look for long-term reward rather than short-term reward. And this is what I've been pursuing all of my life. I never optimized for money or compensation primarily. I always optimized actually for time and freedom. And the older I grow, I realize that time, if any, is this very quality, that's the asset that is immaterial and it's the most expensive one. Nobody can give us back. If you have time lost and wasted, you will never get it back. Mm -hmm. Is this good? Very good, very good. Markus, thank you so much for being uh, today on The Startup Show, episode 157. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Um, thank you very much, everybody out there who stayed all the way till the end. Make sure to stay a few more seconds so you see who is up next week and I'll see you there. Have a great week. Hi everyone, my name is Josef Achman. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Gamaya. And next week uh, we'll be talking about agricultural industry, sophisticated imaging technology. Make sure it's coming next week. <laughs>